I need to tell you another important thing, something that you've never been told, okay? Now, it dates back to, again, the 17th century, okay? But it is very, very important because what happened then is responsible for what's happening now, yeah? And people have little patience for history or interest in the impact of past events on present realities. But time isn't linear and we aren't always moving forward. There is no other way to understand the world we live in today without understanding how we got here in the first place, okay? We are here because of what happened then. Hmm? So if you don't know what happened then, you can't know why we're in this situation now. Do you follow me? And there are certain things which happened in history, which are very, very important. And yet you haven't been told. You've been told some things about certain events at certain times. But some aspects of the story have never been told to you. So then you have to wonder, well, why is it you're telling me half a story? Why is it you are leaving out information which is very, very important? For what purpose are you doing that? Why not tell us the whole story so that we fully understand, so that we have the full picture as to what led up to the glorious revolution of 1689? Hmm? Why are you hiding information? Because there's things which are important that we were never taught in school, okay? Now we're taught about the um, Civil War in England between 1642 and uh, 1651, okay? And then you've got Oliver Cromwell, yeah? So Oliver Cromwell became, you know, Britain became a republic. He was the Lord Protector or whatever it was. And you had this, 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 this kind of um, interim government, okay? Now, we are taught about that and it is important. But what they missed out, and what was very, very important, is that there was a 30-year religious war between 1618 and 1648, okay? 30-year war across the whole of Europe. Millions of people died in this war. And it was a religious war. It was a religious war because the uh, Pope had absolute authority and supremacy across Europe. And so European um, nations were fighting for independence from the authority of the Pope. Okay? For 30 years, religious skirmishes, religious clashes, okay? The culmination of that war in 1648 was the Peace of Westphalia. It was a peace treaty, okay? And it put an end to this um, period of European history, which caused the deaths of millions upon millions of people, okay? Now, the main aspects of the Peace of Westphalia was that each prince would have the right to determine the religion of his own state. Hmm? Each prince had the right to determine the religion of his own state. So not every state now had to be Catholic. Okay? They could now choose whether to be Catholic or whether to be Protestant. Okay? The second aspect of the Peace of Westphalia was the general recognition of the exclusive sovereignty of each party over its own land and its own people the general recognition of the exclusive sovereignty of each party over its lands and its people. So when the Peace of Westphalia was signed by all of these nations across Europe, the Pope was vexed. He was upset hmm? because it took away the authority of Rome after the, over the Western European kings. Okay, So the Peace of Westphalia was such a significant event in the history of Europe and yet we're not taught about this in school. Significant because it dealt with the religious wars and the attempts to break away from the um, absolute authority that Rome had over Western Europe, okay? And it was this 
that led up to the um, civil war in Britain between 1642 and 1651. Okay, now, during that civil war, the king was um, Charles I, okay, and he was executed. There was a war between the Protestants and the Catholics. Charles I was Catholic, by the way. So there's a war between the Catholics and the Protestants. Um, the Protestants won. Charles I was executed in 1649. And he was executed for the offence of treason. The king was executed for treason. And what they said is that the king was guilty of attempting to uphold in himself an unlimited and tyrannical power to rule according to his will and to overthrow the rights and liberties of the people. This was in January 1649 and he was beheaded. Okay, so that's the first aspect that you really need to understand so that you can understand why we're in the position today that we're in. Because it all stems from this religious war, this, 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 this attempt to break away from the absolute authority of Rome across the whole of Western Europe. So you had the 30 year religious war between 1618 and 1648. Yeah, you had the civil war at the same time in England between 1642 and 1651, yeah? where the king was captured and he was beheaded for treason. So at that point in 1651, Britain became essentially a republic. There was no king and Oliver Cromwell was called the Lord Protector. Okay. So that's the first part of it. The second part that you really need to understand is this. There was a guy and his name was Thomas Hobbes. And he was deemed to be a political philosopher. Okay. And he wrote a book in 1651 called Leviathan. Yeah. Now Thomas Hobbes, he went to private school. He went to Oxford. He was part of the establishment. Okay. But his book, Le Leviathan, concerns the structure of society and what he called legitimate government and it is regarded as one of the earliest and most influential examples of the social contract theory the social contract theory okay now the social contract theory is a political ideology it is a theory that concerns the legitimacy of the authority of the state over the individual. Social contract theory states that individuals have consented either explicitly or tacitly to surrender their freedoms and submit to the authority of the ruler or the government in exchange for protection of their remaining rights or to maintain social order. Now, tacitly means it is implied inferred yeah one is silent on it it is taken for granted it is unspoken it is unexpressed or is understood by the individual hmm? tacit consent it is the theory of an implicit social contract which holds that by remaining in the territory controlled by some government people give their consent to join that society and be governed by its government this consent is what gives legitimacy to the government okay there is also something called explicit consent and this means that no room is left for misinterpretation yeah you should directly state what it is um, an individual wants and the person has to respond in a concise manner that either confirms or denies the proposition okay so government is based on this um, political philosophy or this political ideology that there is some social contract in existence okay and that social contract states that individuals have consented either explicitly or tacitly to surrender their freedoms and to submit to the authority of the ruler or government in exchange for protection of their remaining rights or to maintain social order okay 
and there is a relationship between natural and legal rights, okay, which is the topic of social contract theory. I'm going to talk about that in the next video, okay? Social contract theorists seek to demonstrate why a rational individual would voluntarily consent to give up their natural freedoms to obtain the benefits of political order. Hmm? Hobbes said that in a state of nature, human life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. He said in the absence of political order and law, everyone would have unlimited natural freedoms, including the right to all things, and thus the freedom to plunder, rape, and murder. There would be endless war of all against all. He says to avoid this, free men contract with each other to establish a political community through a social contract in which they all gain security in return for subjecting themselves to an absolute sovereign, one man or an assembly of men. An assembly of men is parliament. Mm -hmm. So Hobbes, with his political philosophy, stated that humans consent to abdicate their rights in favour of the absolute authority of government, whether monarchical or parliamentary. Mm -hmm. The central assertion that social contract theory approaches is that law and political order are not natural, but human creations. Mm -hmm. The social contract and the politic it creates are simply a means to an end. The benefits of the individual involved and legitimate only to the extent that they fulfill their part of the agreement. The social contract is legitimate only to the extent that the authority fulfills their part of the agreement. Hmm? So, according to other social contract theorists, they say that when the government fails to secure the individual's rights or satisfy the best interests of society, citizens can withdraw their obligation to obey or seek to change the leadership. Criticism of the social contract by David Hume in 1742. He stresses that the concept of a social contract is a convenient fiction. The concept, the construct of the social contract is merely a convenient fiction. He said this, as no party in the present age can well support itself without a philosophical or speculative system of principles annexed to its political or practical one, we accordingly find that each of the factions into which this nation is divided has reared up a fabric of a former kind in order to protect and lower that scheme of actions which it pursues. The one party and he says, defenders of the absolute and divine right of kings or the Tories, by tracing up government to the deity, endeavour to render it so sacred and inviolate that it must be little less than sacrilege, however tyrannical it may become, to touch or invade it in the smallest article. He goes on, the other party, the Whigs, or believers in constitutional monarchy, by founding government altogether on the consent of the people, Suppose that there is a kind of original contract by which the subjects have tacitly reserved the power of resisting their sovereign whenever they find themselves aggrieved by the authority with which they have for certain purposes voluntarily entrusted him. Hume argued that consent of the government was the ideal foundation on which government should rest, but that it had not actually occurred this way in general. Hmm? tacit consent or explicit consent mm -hmm. tacit consent mm -hmm. so if you say nothing if you say nothing they assume that you have consented to be um, governed by this particular authority that's what tacit consent is yeah this is the situation yeah this is how things are run yeah and if you don't say anything to us, we're going to assume that you consent to everything that it is we do. 
That's tacit consent. And so the uh, social contract theory that was created in the 1650s, yeah, this is what was used to create the um, modern parliament, the system that we live under to this day, that theory, yeah, that there is some kind of social contract and people consent to be governed by parliament. And if you say nothing, they assume that you agree. And this is where we get the, um, the social contract. Hmm? This is where we get the consent of the governed, because that's what a democracy is. They say that a democracy is where you have the consent of the governed. So people don't actually have to consent in writing. Yeah? There is an assumption that everybody, in fact, consents. And this is what is called tacit consent. Hmm? Tacit consent. Hmm? So you either consent in writing or you consent by being silent, by not saying you don't consent. Do you follow me? And so this is where we're at. The situation we have today in the UK, in fact, across the world, is because there is a political ideology, a political construct, which says that everybody consents to be governed by us. So it is a, um, a, a, a man-made creation. It has been made by man. It's a philosophy that was, or an ideology that was posited, that was put forward by an individual. And this is what has been used to create the modern government that we have today. Okay? Because the Bill of Rights is still in existence. Yeah? That was created in 1688, after the revolution. Hmm? And the whole point of the revolution was because Britain did not want to have a Catholic king. Okay? Most of the um, monarchs that you're taught about in school, Henry VIII, he was in fact a Catholic, okay? And he had to appeal to the Pope in order to get a divorce, which the Pope refused, okay? But we hear a lot about Henry VIII in, in school studies, yeah? We also hear about Elizabeth I, okay? She was a Protestant. That's why you hear about Elizabeth I, okay? You don't hear that much about James I, yeah? The one who, you know, wrote his version of the Bible, the Divine Right of Kings. You don't hear much about Charles I. Hmm? You don't hear much about um, Charles II. You don't hear much about James II. And the reason why you don't hear that much about them is because they were all Catholic um, kings. They were all of the Catholic faith. So you hear a lot about the, um, the monarchs who were trying to break away from the authority of Pope, the authority of Rome. Okay? Because Britain has been established as a Protestant nation. You have the Act of Settlement, um, of, of, of 1701, you have the Bill of Rights of 1688. These are saying that Britain is a Protestant nation, okay? And that no Catholic can take the throne in Britain because they have to break away from the authority of Rome. And so they've established it in law that only a monarch who is Protestant can be on the throne in England. And this is why they invited uh, William of Holland to overthrow the king because William of Holland was a Protestant. Do you follow what I'm saying? And the significance of it is this. It was the Peace of Westphalia which gave the sovereigns, the kings, the monarchs, in each individual territory the right to choose his own religion the right to choose his own religion. And if he became Protestant, then they were no longer 
under the authority of Rome. And so this is the reason why we're in exactly the situation now because of the events which happened in the 17th century. And these events are so important that people really ought to have been told the true picture about what in fact has happened. Okay? And so because they've um, created the, 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 the Protestant religion in order to move away from um, the authority of Rome, this is why we have Protestant monarchs in the UK, just so that the UK can be independent and sovereign. So now I've told you exactly what it is you need to know. And they created this doctrine of a social contract. Yeah? That people have agreed to this social contract, which means that they consent to be governed. And this is why we have democracy. This is why we have government, which is the consent of the governed. Thank you for listening. Please share, please subscribe. More videos coming soon.